Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, MedPod Engineer, and this is going to be a parsing of the Allard decision by Justice Phelan on February 24th in Vancouver, BC. 107 page decision, three, four hours of reading. I was wondering, should I just chop out the stuff I need to go on to our memorandum at the Supreme Court of Canada? Because 18,000 people were left out and cut off their grows by these two judges. And we're appealing a whole bunch of them into the Supreme Court of Canada. And I'm, present, I'm pre preparing a memorandum condemning what Manson and Phelan have done. And I get to now include the dirty deeds present in this decision here as we take complaints to the Supreme Court of Canada because I don't expect much is going to happen by Conroy and those people out there. So all of the decision is going to be read in. It's going to be a long time, a lot of stuff repeated, a lot of legal. But if you want it as a resource, you know it's all here. So if you want to sit through rather than try and read the 100 pages yourself, have it read to you by someone who, you know, understands what it's saying and hopefully can ex get it out to you more effectively, uh, enjoy, okay? So this is big for us because it's a bad exemption that strikes down the complete regime. And we have a whole bunch of people. Right now, reserve decision in, in Timmins, Ontario, uh, Justice Rio Pell for Robert Nero. Bad exemption, no offense. So we sent them the information about Allard. And then we have Judge Tax out in Halifax. And uh, we have Judge Haggerty out in Alberta, reserve decision. And we have another couple of Binos quashes coming up on Monday, uh, March 7th in Quebec City and maybe Montreal. And another one in uh, St. John's, Newfoundland on March 21st. And another one in Saskatoon on April the 1st. And we may have one being set up in New Brunswick as well. So people are using this Allard decision, striking down the bad exemption, to argue that there is no offense when there's a bad exemption. Like the last time in 2003 when McAllister argued that the Hitzig declaration of a bad offense meant there was no offense. I mean, bad exemption meant there was no offense for his client. The charges were dropped. Now we want the same thing now using this even stronger bad exemption, leaving no regime left. So, it's a great decision for our people in the criminal courts, even if it leaves the 18,000 self grows who are cut out, left outs, with no relief whatsoever. He doesn't even mention that Beamish and Hebert are still screwed in that decision. Okay? So, anyway, there it is. Enjoy. Here we go, the whole thing. Allard versus Canada. Uh, February the 24th, 2016. Failing J. That's Judge Michael. So, introduction. This is a chartered challenge to the current medical marijuana regime under the Marijuana for Medical Purposes Regulation, brought by four individuals. Now, it started out a class action and got switched to four individuals. And only those four individuals now have any rights to appeal. The others do not. It's important to bear in mind what this litigation is about and equally what it is not about. This case is not about the legalization of marijuana generally or the liberalization of its recreational or lifestyle use. The Gold Stars asked for repeal. It was for us. Nor is it about the commercialization of marijuana for such purposes. And, of course, Manson said that it was about protecting the viability of the MNPR. This case is about the access to marijuana for medical purposes by persons who are ill, including those suffering severe pain and or life-threatening neurological conditions. Such persons also encompass those in the very last stages of their life. Except those whose exemptions expired before March 31st, Manson Massacre Day got knocked out. This is another decision in a line of cases starting with R versus Parker 2000 and culminating in R versus Smith 215 that have examined often with a critical eye the efforts of government to regulate the use of marijuana for medical purposes and the various barriers and impediments to accessing this necessary drug curb. Like other cases, this most recent attempt at restricting access founders on the shoals of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedom 
Part one of the Constitution, Act 1982, being Schedule B to the Canada Act. Particularly Section 7 is not saved by Section 1. The Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms guarantees the rights and freedoms set out in it subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstratively justified in a free and democratic society. So you got rights unless it bothers them too much. Then you don't, like in a war. Everyone has a right to life, liberty, security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. Sounds good, eh? Bye. The court has concluded that the plaintiff's liberty and security interests are engaged by the access restrictions imposed by the NMPR, and that the access restrictions have not been proven to be in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. So, lousy restrictions, no reason for them. Summary overview. The plaintiffs are four individuals who have a medical requirement for marijuana to deal with certain physical conditions from which they suffer. Their lives have been adversely impacted by the imposition of the relatively new regime to control the use of marijuana for medical purposes. The focus of this litigation is the most recent response of the federal government to the teachings of Parker that effectively mandated a regime to make marijuana available for medical purposes to persons in need. So, you need to have a good exemption to have a good offense. The court in Parker held that the criminal prohibition against the possession of marijuana in Section 4 of the CDSA was of no legal effect absent the constitutionally acceptable medical exemption from that prohibition. So if the exemption is absent, so is the prohibition. Get it? Be no. Bad exemption, no offense. Eight, the federal government previously put in place the marijuana medical access regulations in 2001 repealed the MMAR on March 31st, 2014, and put in place a substantially different regime under the MMPR. For purposes of this case, the terms cannabis and marijuana are used interchangeably. Ninth, the fact-finding process in this case was challenging due to volume and relevancy. The case on consent proceeded as a summary trial where affidavit evidence was taken as read into the record, and only those witnesses whom a party wished to cross-examine appeared in court. There was a large volume of evidence not subject to cross-examination, which nevertheless had to be assessed with a critical focus on relevancy and weight. A list of the witnesses for the parties, both lay and expert, is attached as Schedule A. 10. The previous jurisprudence on marijuana for medical purposes under the MMAR was extremely helpful in establishing the relationship between the Section 7 interests and the consumption of marijuana for medical purposes. After the trial concluded, the Supreme Court rendered its decision in Smith, discussed more fully later. That decision held that the former medical access regime's limitation to the use of only dried marijuana unjustifiably violated the guarantees in Section 7. This trial was reopened to permit the parties to make submissions on the effect of the Smith decision on the present case. And that's where Tucson tried to say marijuana should be struck off Schedule 2, like we have asked in the Gold Stars action that was stayed by Thalen, and Phelan said, because you didn't ask for originally, you don't get it. And because the other gold stars are stayed, they don't get it either. But that's the right answer. Repeal. So, um, the trial was reopened to permit that evidence. Okay, that decision reaffirms the connection between Section 7 rights and the restrictions on the use of marijuana and disposes of the question of the methods of consumption issue raised as one of the numerous issues in this trial. The restriction to dried marijuana under the MMPR is void for the same reasons it was held to be void under the MMAR in Smith. Bam! So, the question is, was that bad exemption so bad that it made the regime unworkable? It's like saying, gee, the steering wheel wasn't working, but the rest of the car was. Well, if it wasn't working, it wasn't working. And... That's why when in 2003 they struck down those other grower flaws, they said, geez, without tires inflated, it ain't working, and they struck down a prohibition. Well, now, with this even worse violation of the rights to life, not letting them use their meds properly, as opposed to not letting them grow their meds properly in 2003, this is a worse bad exemption for no offense. So, 12. On the issue of the proper dosages, and the alleged therapeutic effects of different strains of marijuana, there remains significant scientific debate on this topic. It 
matters and it doesn't. Who do you think's right? A clear theme running through the evidence of this trial is that despite the lengthy period for which marijuana for medical purposes has been available, there is a paucity of evidence, particularly from government, in respect of its use and effects. Marijuana is not treated as a medicine by statute, regulation, or policy, and the information gap posed a significant problem. In addition to methods of consumption, the evidence adduced during the course of litigation focused on the plaintiff's access to marijuana, considering dosages, strains, cultivation, cost economics, and the administration of the drug in other jurisdictions. 13. The anecdotal evidence of the plaintiffs on the impact of different strains is accepted, but its weight is not significant. The court is not in any position to prescribe or condone different medical treatments. The defendant asks the court to conclude that, given the high level of use of medical marijuana, significantly more than some other countries, Canadian medical practitioners are, in effect, over-prescribing medical marijuana. There is insufficient evidence for this court to reach that conclusion, much less ground a Section 1 finding on that basis. 14. To the extent that affordability was advanced as a ground of Section 7 violation, it has not been made out. Wow. Well, that's because Conroy didn't have any poor guys. They could all afford to grow theirs, and they could probably all afford to have a shot at paying LP prices, but a lot of my friends do not. More importantly, it is not necessary to make such a finding. Affordability can be a barrier to access, particularly where it is a choice made to expend funds on medical treatment to the detriment of other basic needs. However, this case does not turn on a right to cheap drugs, nor a right to grow one's own, nor do the plaintiffs seek to establish such a positive right from government. No, me neither. I just want the government to get out of the way. The evidence does establish that under the single source system of licensed producer, LP, there is no guarantee that the necessary quality, strain, and quantity will be available when needed at some acceptable level of pricing. Though such mechanisms as flexible pricing or discount pricing, due to the structure of the regulations and the characteristics of the market, Ultimately, considering that liberty and security interests are engaged, the court has found that the evidence of each plaintiff's individual circumstances was sufficient to demonstrate that the regulatory restrictions in the MMPR upon the individuals, including but not limited to the prohibitions against certain methods of consumption and plant growth by a patient, by his or her delegate, does not bear a connection to the objective of the legislation and is therefore arbitrary. In other words, they ain't got a good reason for putting that prohibition on you. Arbitrary, that's what that means. The access restrictions did not prove to reduce risk to health or safety and to improve access to marijuana, the purported objectives of the regulation. In the alternative, even if some connection is found, the restriction is still overbroad and does not minimally impair Section 7 rights. Background. A regulatory scheme. A, sorry, 17. Drugs and controlled substances are primarily regulated by the CDSA, the Food and Drugs Act, and the reg, related regulation. Cannabis marijuana is a controlled substance scheduled under the CDSA and a narcotic subject to the narcotic control regulations. Subsequent to the Ontario Court of Appeals decision in Parker, referred to earlier, which in practical terms mandated a constitutionally acceptable medical exemption for the use of marijuana, Good exemption for good offense, bad exemption, no offense. The federal government, Canada, enacted the MMAR. These regulations have been amended numerous times in response to decisions from various courts. Now, he didn't mention in 2003 when they were amended by striking down the flaws. The other court also said, whoa, bad exemption, no offense. We're quashing JP's charge, and then the government withdrew 4,000 more. So, I got that, uh, MMP, MMAR, 19. The MMAR, prior to its repeal and replacement with the MMPR, permitted individuals who had the support of a medical practitioner to obtain an authorization to possess, ATP, marijuana for medical purposes from Health Canada, 20. The MMAR did not set any limit on a daily dosage a doctor could authorize. However, it did impose a cap on the amount of marijuana that an ATP holder could possess at 30 times one's daily dosage. And a larger number, I think it's 454 or less times that dosage for yearly storage. 
Under the MMAR, ATP license holders could obtain lawful access to marijuana in one of three ways. Through a personal use production license, which permitted the individual ATP license holder to grow a certain quantity of marijuana for his or her own use, but not allowed to have any help. And through a designated person production license that permitted a person designated by an ATP license holder to produce marijuana for up to two ATP license holders. It used to be one, and Hitzig struck down one, and they put back one, and then Svetkopulo struck down one, and then they upped it to two patients per grower. When one was found unconstitutional, they figured two is that much better. So, um, I, uh, so through a personal use production license, which permitted, yeah, yeah, that's right, and finally through purchasing dried marijuana directly from Health Canada, which had contracted with a private company to produce and distribute medical marijuana. Three ways. The production of marijuana under the PUPL or DPPL could only be conducted at the site designated on that license. Cultivation could be indoors or outdoors, although not both at the same time. Three twenty-three. There were no restrictions as to the location of the production facility beyond the fact that if outdoors, it could not be adjacent to a school, public playground, daycare center, or other public place frequented mainly by persons less than 18 years of age. There were mandatory compliance requirements that license holders had to meet, including compliance with all local bylaws. The number of plants that could be grown by a person with a production license was calculated as a formula set up in the MMAR based primarily on the ATP license holder's authorized daily dose. And it was actually about five times the number of grams per day. About one less, usually. The LMAR permitted up to four production licenses to be issued in respect to the same site. And it used to be three in Hitzing, struck down. And they put back three, struck down by Baron. Then they put back four. Three was unconstitutional, but limiting it to four, much better, right? So, um... There was significant growth in ATPs between 2002 and the end of 2013 from 455 to 37,151. And in PUPL, from 326 to 28,000. So, the growth was expected to continue. 26. As of December 31st, 2013, the average daily dosage was 18.22 grams per day. Keep that in mind. They knew the average daily dosage. And he's mentioning it now because uh, it's important which permitted an individual to grow 89 plants. That is five, right? Well, it should have been closer than a little more than that. This level of daily dosage was significantly higher than in Israel or the Netherlands, two countries used in this case by Canada as comparators to suggest that daily dosage is a problem in this country. The MMAR provided, and don't forget, they had other surveys that were out and out fraudulent, and that's why we're claiming cash in our statements of claim. If the government just did it, oops, sorry if I destroyed your life, can't do anything. But oops, there was fraud in there, now you can. The MMAR provided for an inspection system under which Health Canada inspectors were required to either obtain consent to enter a dwelling or secure a warrant. As part of the defendant's justification for the new system, Health Canada estimated that the inspection of all residential growing operations in existence in 2013 would cost $55 million if they did them all. The growing number, so shut them down. It would cost us too much to check them out. The number of, has little relevance in the absence of evidence to show that the inspection of all sites annually is reasonably justified. Okay, good. Health Canada produced no evidence of the amount of inspections necessary to ensure compliance with the regulations. 28. As evident in the justification for the new MPR, Program costs were significant, if not dominant, priority, not medical relief. The administrative cost of operating the MMAR program and supplying dried marijuana became significant as demand increased. In 2005 and 6, the cost of the program was $5 million a year. By 2012, it was projected to increase over $15 million a year, while Canada is spending $56,000 million on warplanes. As Health Canada subsidized the cost of the marijuana it sold to the extent of 50% of product cost, the annual $15 million cost included this subsidy. So the bureaucratic cost wasn't all that much more. Oh, so bureaucratic expenses, right. MNPR, 
30. The defendant, through the evidence of the then director of the Bureau of Medical Cannabis, director of medical marijuana regulatory reform, contended that concerns about the MMAR led to government reform. She was the defendant's key witness on the rationale for changes in the medical marijuana regime as incorporated in the MMPR. A series of decisions, including Hitzig versus Canada, and Svetkopoulos versus Canada, and Barron versus Canada, had required changes to the regulatory regime to lessen the restrictions on cultivation and facilitate the access to marijuana for medical purposes. Yeah, one patient to grow or judge too small, now it's two. Three sites to, three gardens to site too small, now it's four. So, 31, the director contended that the concerns arising from the MMAR included the rapid increase in the number of individuals authorized to possess and produce increasing amounts of marijuana. The fact that the majority of medical marijuana was grown in dwelling houses, which were not constructed to support large scale operation. Thank God most weren't large scale. And the unintended negative impacts on public health, safety, and security, which covered such matters as mold, fires, thefts, harms from fertilizers, odors, and diversion to the black market. She further contended that some MAR program participants had expressed dissatisfaction due to regulatory wait times. Yeah, how come I can get my driver's license fixed instantaneously and these clowns got a computer and they can't do the same? Finally, she stated that the program was becoming an administrative and financial burden for the federal government. They needed that $15 million to add to the $56,000 million for warplanes, I know. 32. While the director asserted that Health Canada had received complaint letters from certain B.C. and Ontario districts, fire officials, and neighbors of PUPL holders, these references were vague and not extensive. The reference to municipality feedback consisted of eight instances. A BC fire chief, a BC mayor, a BC municipality, an Ontario Fu Municipal Fire Authority, an administrative officer in a BC district, a large BC community, a large a BC district, and an Ontario Police Services official. Against this background, the director acknowledged in cross-examination that Health Canada, despite having data for the kilograms of marijuana produced by MMAR licenses, 15,000 keys a month, had no data with respect to public safety issues, including fires, thefts, harms arising from fertilizers and other chemicals used in gardens. No effort had been made to collect such data. So they're just worried about all these, up, all these possible things, even if they got no idea if they can happen at all, and they don't mind bringing it up. So Health Canada had no statistics relating to incidents in which people who produced their own marijuana became sick from it. <laughs> The federal government was and would continue to be the major beneficiary to move to the MMPR in terms of cost savings, and the persons who were and would continue to be most impacted were the patients due to the increase in cost. Health Canada had no information that the plaintiffs or a substantial number of licensees ever overproduced their licenses, diverted marijuana to the black market, produced unsafely, caused smells, had any fires, produced any moldy marijuana, or suffered any negative health consequences from consuming their medicine. <laughs> Whoa! Despite this lack of data and information, Health Canada began the process to develop a new regime by 2010. The key principles of this new regime included, now remember, they had, none of those other things were substantiated, those concerns, but they're now switching to a new regime because of those unsubstantiated concerns. Treat marijuana as much as possible like any other medication, but not as a pharmaceutical drug. <laughs> what does that mean? Anyway, treat marijuana and restore Health Canada's role as a regulator and eliminate the government's role in supplying and distributing marijuana for medical purposes. Fine. Create a new supply and distribution system using fully regulated, inspected, and audited LPs if they could have done it on time to meet demand, but they didn't. Phase out personal and designated production and institute mechanisms for compliance and enforcement. Not a massive bureaucracy that they don't want to spend on medical people, but they do want to spend on commercial people. They got money to spend on enforcement and compliance, but not on updating licenses. 
phase out personal and designated production and institute mechanisms for compliance and enforcement. Reduce the risk of abuse and exploitation of the regulatory regime, which means make sure we check that you got a real doctor's prescription, you got the real thing and got the right x-rays, you know. Make the doctor sweat harder to sign. And, uh, and improve access to marijuana for medical purposes. <laughs> In the same sentence. Making it harder on you, but improving access. Address the public health and safety risks that police, fire authorities, and municipalities had expressed to Health Canada. Of course, none of them were valid and they had no facts, but how do we handle those concerns? And finally, provide physicians with up-to-date information on the use of marijuana for medical purposes to physicians who don't have to sign anyway and don't want to know because they don't make any money. My friend Tom Kennedy just died last Thursday. Doctor wouldn't let him use cannabis oil while his tumor was small. Wanted to cut. Hey, surgical fees, right? And then went, oops, can't save it. Close them back up and it spread like wildfire. Dead in six months. Yes, sir, don't want to take away those doctor's uh, fees. And finally, they're worried about that and provide the physicians with up-to-date information. Well, actually, pretty incompetent, unprofessional physicians who haven't lucked into this up-to-date information on their own. Imagine an engineer who didn't have up-to-date information on steel and cement. Health Canada examined different possibilities and issues and also engaged in a consultation process that included online consultation, meetings with stakeholders and consultations following a draft publication in the Canada Gazette. And this is what they came up with. <laughs> However, the particulars of the policy process are not particularly relevant to the court's consideration of the impact of the MMPR on the plaintiff's charter rights. The court's role is only to determine if the policy or regulations comply with the charter, not if their development was accurate, adequate. Even a bad policy may be charter compliant. The Supreme Court of Canada, in Canada, Attorney General versus PhD Community Services Society, stated the following on the role of the court. It is for the relevant governments, not the court, to make criminal health policy. However, when a policy is translated into law or state action, those laws and actions are subject to the scrutiny under the charter. Da, 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 da. The issue before Rodriguez was, the court at this point is not whether a harm reduction or abstinence-based programs are the best approach to resolving illegal drug use. It's simply whether Canada has limited the rights of the claimants in a matter that does not comply with the charter. And usually when you find dead people, you can say, gee, I guess it didn't. But dead people haven't impacted these guys yet. Similarly, the issue before the court is not whether the LP regime, MMPR, or the personal cultivation regime, MMAR, is the best approach for access to medical cannabis. Simply whether Canada has limited the rights of the plaintiffs in a matter that does not comply with the charter. In the end, the NMPR completely reformed the medical marijuana access regime, most substantially invalidating all PUPLs and DPPLs and the amount an individual is authorized to possess. It dispo I mean carry, actually, you can store more. It dispossessed licensees of the ability to control the medical marijuana they consume. Yeah. 39, Justice Manson in his March 21st disorder. He kept the MMAR largely in place for qualified persons. Note the cover. He didn't say medically qualified persons. He meant court qualified persons. Because Justice Manson, they're going to cover this up now. It's not what you're going to hear about. Go YouTube for 18,000 Court of Appeal cut out left outs. And you'll get the video explaining what happened to them. But by talking here about qualified persons, he means the judge, those that Manson deemed qualified. Not medically qualified because he cut off medically qualified people. Here's what happened. He said, I grandfather everybody's grow permits, okay, whether they're expired or not, so people can around go run around growing, oh, grow permits have been extended. But then he said, I'm not extending everybody's possessed permits, whether expired or not. Only those still not expired get to live, and those that are expired, ha ha, your grow permits are no good without them. So, though everybody celebrates, yes, we've got our grow permits, everybody got them expired, 
half the people couldn't use them. And Thielen is covering it up by saying, in place for qualified persons. And he means that qualified by Manson due to dates, not to medical need. Now let's listen to him cover it up. <coughs> Allard Manson summarized the situation as follows, 15. The MMPR mandates that dried marijuana be produced by a licensed producer, pursuant to section 12 of the MMPR, Individuals who formerly were or could be issued an ATP must register the prescription of a medical practitioner with an LP to obtain dried marijuana. If they do so, Section 3 authorizes them to obtain and possess marijuana produced by that LP. The amount authorized for possession under Section 5 is lower than under the MMAR, either 150 grams or 30 times the amount prescribed for daily consumption by the individual medical practitioner, whichever is less. An LP is required to meet various quality and security measures as per sections 12 to 101. This includes provisions in sections 13 14, which state that the production site may not be outdoors or in a dwelling place. Four, judicial context. Uh, as of 1999, it was only possible for individuals in Canada to produce, possess marijuana for medical purposes by way of a section 56 of the CDSA exemption, which allows Minister of Health to exempt any person or class of persons from the application of the CDSA or its regulations if necessary for a medical or scientific purpose or if it is otherwise in the public interest. In 2000, the Ontario Court of Appeal in Parker dealt with an accused charge of a cultivation of marijuana under the former Narcotic Control Act and with possession of marijuana under the CDSA. He needed the marijuana to control his epilepsy as there was no legal source of the type of marijuana he required. Parker grew his own. The Ontario Court of Appeal upheld the trial, finding that the prohibition against marijuana in Section 4 of the CDSA infringed Parker's Section 7 charter rights. The Court of Appeal declared the prohibition on possession of marijuana in the CDSA to be of no force in effect, but suspended declaration for one year. Based on the principles established by the Supreme Court of Canada in Morgenthaler and Rodriguez, uh, the court concluded that forcing Parker to choose between his health and imprisonment violated his right to liberty and security of the person. And notice that Phelan didn't seem to notice that forcing the left outs into losing their exemptions because of a date was exactly forcing them to choose between their health and imprisonment if they grew again. Sounds so lofty when he talks about the rights of the group, but when you keep in mind half of them have been cut out and he ain't mentioned it, doesn't seem so lofty no more. Hypocritical, actually. This violation did not accord with the principles of fundamental justice for Parker, nor was the unfettered discretion of the minister to provide an exemption under Section 56 of the CDSA consistent with the principles of fundamental justice. Wasn't good enough that you got to ask the minister for an exemption. He needed something official. Regime reforms. So, Hitzig, Parker, Termel, Pocket, that's us. So, following upon Parker, the federal government promulgated the MMAR, outlined earlier in these reasons. In Hitzig, the Ontario Court of Appeal dealt with three civil applications challenging the constitutionality of the MMAR. It was originally called Parker, Hitzig, or Parker, Termel, and Pocket, and Hitzig. Officially, you can go see one of the decisions early from uh, Judge Crady, I believe, where it was Parker and Termel, because we're with the appellants, and Hitzig, he was a cross appellant. So, and then the Court of Appeal in the big decision switched, and they put the cross appellant's name first so that Alan Young could get credit for my win. Yeah, one of the dirtiest backroom deeds ever done. Instead of being called Parker II, it was now called Hitzig. So everywhere in the law books you read Hitzig, it should have been called Parker too, except for the switch in the back room at the last minute. By the time the government brought in the MMAR in 2001, it had decided that government-supplied marijuana from its prairie plant systems, the only authorized grow of marijuana, which typically supplied marijuana to those who not grow their own or have a designate, would be available only for research purposes. The court, in declaring certain provisions of the MMAR invalid, allowed all DPPL holders to be compensated to grow for more than one ATP holder, and to combine their growing with more than two other DP holders, and now it's up to three <laughs> after Barron. And they put the limits right back. So anyway, the court also acknowledged that the government could choose to address the constitutional difficulty of marijuana supply by an approach fundamentally different from that contemplated by the MMAR. 
46. This court in Svetkopoulos heard a judicial review application to declare invalid Section 41 of the MMAR, a bad exemption, but they forgot to ask for no offense. Alan Young, like Hitson, forgot then too, which restricted a designated licensee to producing medical marijuana for only one user. The substantive issue was whether the remedial steps taken by Canada had brought the MMAR into conformity with the charter requirements, identified in Parker and Hitson. As those cases held, the charter requires that the government not hinder access to marijuana for no good reason, and for those with a demonstrated need to obtain and use this substance, except those who aren't qualified by Manson, right? Dates. But all those other people, yeah, they need the medicine, should get it, but not those Manson said were outdated. Justice Strayer, following the reasoning in those two decisions, concluded that Section 41, one patient per grower, constituted an impermissible restriction on the Section 7 liberty and security rights of the applicants. The comments of Justice Strayer are prescient to this case. The liberty interest identified by Justice Strayer would include the right to choose on medical advice to use marijuana for the treatment of serious conditions, and you still don't have it when your doctor can say no. Tom Kennedy, I want to cut you first. Um, and then the right to have not have one's physical liberty endangered by the risk of imprisonment from having to access marijuana illegally, and the 18,000 cutoffs now suffer that again, do they not? The security interest included similar rights for those with medical need to have access to medication without undue interference. This court's emphasis. Well, what about the 18,000 cut off with this court's emphasis? Emphasis. Ah, with respect to the principles of fundamental justice, Justice Strayer held that the limitation on DPPLs and therefore the limitation on access did little or nothing to enhance the state's interest. As such, it was arbitrary. The court critically examined the limitations on DPPLs and found them lacking justification. The government, so they upped it to two. As such, it was arbitrary. They, the court critically examined the limitations, found them lacking the government's justification, to some extent similar to the regulatory impact analysis statement in the present case, included the need to control distribution of an unapproved drug the desire to minimize risk of diversion to non-authorized use, and consistency with international obligations, and movement toward a supply model where there would be product standards and regulated production with the advice of physicians. Sounds all so official, doesn't it? The government's concern about the risk of diversion had to be justified, and it was found not to be. Nobody's ever been busted, or few. Um, on the issue of the movement to a supply model, the court stated that, well, that, well, may be a laudable goal, and if ever reached, would make unnecessary litigation such as the present case. But we do not know when this new age will dawn, and in the meantime, the courts, in their wisdom, have concluded that persons with serious conditions, whose exemptions haven't expired, for which marijuana provides some therapy, should have reasonable access to it, unless their possessed permits had expired. It is not... In answer to say that someday there may be a better system, yeah, if their exemptions are expired, nor does the hope for the future explain why a designated producer must be restricted to one customer. Now it's two. <laughs> In the present case, one of the issues is why a customer must be restricted to a single supply. The restraint on access was not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice because it did not respond to the concerns motivating the Hitzig decision and left ATP holders who are unable to grow for themselves and who cannot engage a designated producer due to MMAR restrictions to seek marijuana on the black market. In Justice Strayer's view, one which could with slight adaptation be replicated here, it is not tenable for the government consistently with the right established in other courts for qualified medical users. Ah, that's everybody now. Medical users, not just qualified users by Manson. They're not qualified Manson users. To have reasonable access to marijuana, to force them either to buy from the government contractor, grow their own, or be limited to the unnecessarily restrictive system of designated producers. At the moment, their only alternative is to acquire marijuana illicitly. And that, according to Hitzig, is inconsistent with the rule of law and therefore with the principles of fundamental justice. As seen earlier, 
the MNPR limits a patient to a single government-approved contractor and eliminates the ability to grow one's own marijuana or to engage one's own designated producer. That system is likewise not tenable. 55. The court found Section B1 to be arbitrary, contrary to the principles of fundamental justice, not rationally connected to its objectives, and a disproportional restraint to any state interest promoted. And if one patient per grower was bad, how great is two patients per grower now? Um, in 209, the BCSC rendered its decision in Barron, dealing with the challenge of Section 5 and 7 of the CDSA. It focused, that's okay, it focused on the failure of the MMAR to provide practical access to medical marijuana for those with medical conditions would appear to fall within the exemption provided, despite the amendments following Hitzig and a change in policy with respect to the availability of medical marijuana for qualified patients through government supply. The court in Barron largely adopted the court's reasoning in Hitzig and Svetkopoulos in respect to fundamental justice and Justice Strayer's reasoning in Svetkopoulos in respect of impediments to supply. Following Svetkopoulos and Barron, the MMAR was amended to further facilitate access <coughs> to medical marijuana. And that's now two patients instead of one and four growers instead of three. It has been amended to further facilitate access. In the context of the MMAR at the time of its replacement by the MNPR, the judicial teachings were that access for approved medical patients was mandated by the charter. Unless they're not Manson approved, right? And that restrictions on access, use, and supply were to be strictly limited. It is evident that Canada struggled with these two conflicting notions of access and control, as well as direction towards greater access. <laughs> Keep managing to cut down on access by more control, you know? Sorry, we aim too much at control and we cut off your access again. Just aim any control. I uh, seen in its structure and evidence from the review of its operation, the NPR proved moved in the opposite direction. No kidding. As usual, even after the MMPR had been enacted, significant developments affecting the MMAR moved through the court system. In Smith, first decided by the British Columbia Supreme Court, the accused argued that the CDSA and MMAR could not constitutionally prohibit rendering dried cannabis into oils and other substitutes. The case was an attack on MMAR provision, also found in the MPR, that only dried cannabis be used. The trial judge found against the limitation to dried marijuana. The matter moved through to the Supreme Court in Smith. The appeal required the court to decide whether a, that's in BC, whether a medical access regime that only permits access to dried marijuana unjustly violates the guarantee of life, liberty, and security of the person contrary to Section 7 of the Charter. The Supreme Court reaffirmed the lower court decision that the medical marijuana regime engaged in Section 7 rights. More specifically, the legislative scheme's restriction of medical marijuana to dried marijuana limited Section 7 rights in several ways. The prohibition on possession of cannabis derivatives infringed Smith's liberty interest in exposing him to the threat of imprisonment on convictions. The prohibitions engaged the liberty interest of medical marijuana users as they could face criminal sanctions if they produce or possess or blah, blah, blah. The prohibition on possession of active cannabis compounds for medical purposes limits liberty by foreclosing reasonable medical choices through the threat of criminal prosecution. Specifically, the state prevents people who have already established a legit need for marijuana, a need the legislative scheme purports to accommodate from choosing the method of administration. The right to security of the person is infringed by forcing a person to choose between a legal but inadequate treatment and an illegal but more effective choice of administration of marijuana. And the prohibitions on non-dried medical marijuana were also arbitrary because they undermined the health and safety of medical marijuana users by diminishing the quality of their medical care. The effect of the prohibition, which in reality limited usage to smoking marijuana, contradicted the objective of the medical marijuana regime. Again, what they did contradicted what they said they were doing. German, germane to the present case, the Supreme Court accepted the trial court's conclusion that the evidence did not establish a connection between the restriction on dry and the promotion of health and safety. A general proposition of the defendant is that the MMPR is justified on health and safety grounds and addresses such concerns as diversion of medical marijuana into the illegal market, a fact not supported by the evidentiary record in Smith. 
Yeah, if nobody can grow by themselves, nobody can sell anything. Nobody can commit a crime. Treat them all like criminals and nobody can commit a crime. On the matter of Section 1 justification, the Supreme Court has been stated. The remaining question is whether the Crown has shown this violation of Section 7 to be reasonable and demonstrably justified under Section 1 of the Charter. As explained in Bedford, the Section 1 analysis focuses on the furtherance of the public interest and thus differs from the Section 7 analysis, which is focused on the infringement of the individual rights. However, in this case, the objective of the prohibition is the same in both analyses, the protection of health and safety. It follows that the same disconnect between the prohibition and its object that renders it arbitrary under Section frustrates the requirement under Section 1 that the limit on the right be rationally connected to a pressing objective. Like the courts below, we conclude that the infringement of Section 7 is not justified under Section 1 of the Charter. The Smith decision confirmed the teachings of the prior jurisprudence in respect of improving access to medical marijuana, but dealt specifically with one aspect of the challenge to the MMPR, the restriction to dried marijuana. <clears throat> the current challenge to the MMPR is more broadly based and attacks the very foundation and operation of the MMPR as an integrated regulatory scheme. <coughs> <coughs> Factual background. In the context of the earlier background, the medical marijuana regime under the MMPR and the trial evidence must be assessed. Medical marijuana use. The medical benefits of marijuana were largely undisputed at trial and have been recognized in previous cases. It's therefore not necessary to exhaust all the medical evidence that was adduced in the course of this litigation. It's important to note, however, that aspects of the therapeutic benefit and dosage remain disputed for particularly illnesses, particular illnesses in individuals. The following is a brief overview of some of the medical findings. Marijuana has medicinal value for certain individuals, particularly in terms of pain relief, reducing nausea and stimulating appetite. Conditions that allow for medical marijuana use in Peralia include chronic neuropathic pain, HIV, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, Tourette's syndrome, fibromyalgia. It's also used in the context of palliative care and for end-of-life patients. There is limited research and scientific knowledge on marijuana as a medicine. Well, I wouldn't say that. There's been a lot of research in the last few. He's just not up to date on it. Although disputed, there are risks with consuming marijuana. Well, not of dying. Accordingly, there is a need for studies of adverse effects in long-term users of marijuana for medical purposes. Dosage. <clears throat> it was agreed by the experts that there was no possibility of overdose death from cannabis consumption by humans, whether the consumption is oral, inhaled, or topical. Conversely, unless a bail drops on you or uh, you get executed for trafficking somewhere. Conversely, medically appropriate dosages of cannabis were an issue of significant debate. The defendant suggested an, uh, overdosing pursuant to overprescription was a serious problem. Dosages were also relevant when determining methods of consumption. The position of the experts regarding dosage more generally is summarized below. Now, just keep in mind, you want to make oil, you need more. Dr. Pate, plaintiff's expert on botany and pharmacology, stated that there's little scientific research on the efficacy of marijuana products or the medically appropriate dosage. He agreed that marijuana overdoses can produce side effects that are extremely unpleasant. Sleep. And postulated that orally ingesting cannabis-based medicines may require lesser dosages. One reason why oral ingestion results in the amelioration of unwanted side effects. Pate further admitted that this was difficult to confirm because it would depend on the case at hand, including the route of administration, the effect desired, and the individual patient tolerance. So basically, he had no information to give. <laughs> Dr. Baruch, defendant's expert on cannabis use in Israel, gave evidence based on his research and experience in Israel. He stated that physicians in Israel may recommend medical marijuana starting at 20 grams a month <laughs> and the dose can be increased with the support of another physician up to a maximum dose of 100 grams a month. Three grams a day. Can you believe how little oil you can end up with? 
Medically appropriate maximum dosage should not exceed five grams per day. Oh, imagine, hey, you might end up with a gram of oil a day out of that, right? So, dosages beyond this amount do not provide any additional therapeutic benefit. Well, you might get an extra gram if you doubled it and may result in adverse effects. Consumption amounts to one gram per day in Israel and only 86 permits for an amount of marijuana exceeding 100 grams have been issued. Only 86, which represents less than 0.5% of authorized patients. One in 200. Of these 86 exemptions, none exceed 200 grams per month. So what? Did some hit 199? <laughs> they don't tell you. Samuel. Dr. Baruch noted that there's cumulating evidence that the response to escalating doses of cannabis has an inverted U shape. As the dose increases above a certain point, the effectiveness of cannabis decrease and risk side effects increase. This is one more reason why physicians prescribing cannabis should be extra cautious when using escalating doses, especially when reaching high doses above two grams per day. <laughs> Two or three joints a day, high dosages. Finally, Dr. Baruch commented on the growing literature concerning the development of tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal from cannabis use, especially among heavy cannabis users. My quick story about withdrawal. In 1993, I was busted Project Robin Hood, running the biggest game in house in history, 28 tables. I was sentenced to 200 hours playing my accordion in old folks' homes. And I told the judge, I'll do, just give me the hours, I'll get them done in a certain amount of time. He said, no, I want 10 every month. Oh, no. Well, I had to go down to Atlantic City to play poker to make a living. Then I had to come back at the end of, every, of a month, play 10 hours, and then play another 10 hours in the next week before I would bus it back to Atlantic City for six weeks of poker and then come back to Ottawa, play my accordion concerts over the two weeks straddling the month to get my 20 hours in. I did this 10 cycles. But I can tell you that when I went south, I did not suffer any kind of withdrawal for marijuana at all. And when I came back to Canada, it was whoopee, party again. But I couldn't risk my livelihood with marijuana down in crazy land. So there were 10 cycles of party in Canada and then cut off for six weeks in the States, back to party in Canada, cut off for six, hey, accordion concerts, I play better when I'm high. Back and forth for 10 times, never felt withdrawal once, which lets me conclude that marijuana is more like chocolate ice cream addiction. You know, if it's there, you'll eat it. If it's not, who cares? Won't hurt you. So, Dr. Danik, defendant's expert on cannabis use and dosage, that's a crown of defendants, stated that in his experience, most of his patients generally lose three to five grams a day, only when necessary, with some patients using much less. He noted that there are no medical indications for the use of amounts in excess of five grams per day. One heck of a stupid doctor to stand up in public and say that, eh? The College of Family Physicians of Canada agrees that one to three grams per day is a medically appropriate dosage. The guys who haven't studied it at all have an opinion. In his expert report, Dr. Danik states that despite the fact that there's no medical reason for dosages over five grams per day, except the guy happens to still be in pain, he wants to smoke another joint. Um, only a quarter of patients under the MMAR were approved for one to five grams per day. The majority were approved for over 10 grams a day. Dr. G, and he thinks the average is one to three still, right? Dr. Danik opined on several reasons for these high dosages. These reasons were not factually supported. Well, the one I got is you want to make oil, you got to reduce it, right? So, Dr. Ferris, uh, okay, uh, plaintiff's rebuttal expert on use and dosage generally agrees that doses of three to five grams of cannabis per day are adequate for most. However, the dose for oral consumption is two and a half times the inhaled consumption dose. I would have guessed more like five to seven hash and oil reduced to. 
Thus, the prescribed range for patients consuming marijuana via edibles can easily be 10 to 12 grams per day, especially if you juice, okay? Tolerance, genetics, and access to low and high potency strains also needs to be considered to determine dosage. Dosage is determined through doctor-patient interactions and dialogues that result in a dosage that works for the particular patient's medical issues, and not some ignorant doctor's association's guess. Dr. Kellant, defendant's expert on mar medical marijuana use, opined that dosages beyond 5 grams per day do not provide any additional therapeutic benefit and may result in adverse effects. I remember my neighbor, Mark Paquette, this guy would do a big doobie every half an hour for his litany of diseases. No one's received more exemptions in Canada than Mark Paquette, and there's no way he's going to live on five grams and five doobies a day. So, specifically, he testified that a number of studies of medical marijuana have found that progressive increases in dosage at first increase the therapeutic effect, but further increases lead to loss of therapeutic effect and replacement by adverse effects. What, sleepiness? He accepted and elaborated on the inverted U-shaped phenomenon described by Dr. Baruch. I'd like to hear about some adverse effects. Dr. Kalant touched upon a problem that's run throughout this case, that despite the government having exerted control over medical marijuana, there is a surprising lack of research to justify many of the assumptions relied on by the government because they make it up. He acknowledged that there is this insufficient evidence on which to base scientifically reasoned dosage ranges for different medical uses, and acknowledged that patients can develop significant levels of tolerance to the effects of particularly dosages. And that's why they're smoking more, as long as it's not hurting them, right? So, oh, but they gotta take more to get the same effect, okay. And they gotta then take more to get the same effect, okay. And they gotta take more and sometimes they fall asleep, okay. So, Dr. Clark, plaintiff's rebuttal expert on cannabis use, commented that high potency of cannabis in the medical context means that a patient needs to consume less to achieve medical efficacy, lowering the chance of adverse side effects. Medicinal users do not want to overconsume, and they want to avoid side effects. So the stronger, the better, the less you use. Self-titration, it's called. Haven't run into that word yet. Finally, the Bureau of Medic Medical Cannabis in the Netherlands estimates that the average daily dosage of medical marijuana in that country is about 0.68 grams per patient. That's the funny one. Anyway, however, this data must be approached with caution, considering the particulars of that regime, including access to coffee shops selling marijuana. The availability of marijuana in that generally unenforced environment calls into question the weight given to some of the evidence from that bureau. Yeah, yeah, but then again, over here, our one to three gram average was actually the Canada sales average. And the 18 was actual prescribed use, sales, and growth. Get it? They just never made the distinction. But check it out. One to three gram sales. And that's where they got it from. In my view, the way the evidence presented in this court is that the medically appropriate dose may depend on individual tolerance, particularly potency of strains, e.g. the CBD and the THC ratios, and the route of administration and the content of the edible. Canada has an exceedingly high dosage, and the reasons suggested for this were vastly speculative. Many of the experts agree that there was a U-shaped effect where after a certain amount, the medicinal effect of the cannabis is limited, and you ought to smoke more. They recommend the amount is largely agreed upon as 1 to 5 grams per day. Yeah, 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 18 is prescribed, but they would say it's 1 to 5 still. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. So there is insufficient evidence to determine why dosages in Canada are so high, and what the effect on patients would be if they were to consume less than currently prescribed. Well, probably a lot of pain, I guess. Methods of consumption. Much of the debate regarding methods of consumption and illegal prohibition against non-dried marijuana has been dealt with in spam. The finding that the dry marijuana restriction was more dangerous to one's health than other forms of consumption undermines the defendant's position that the MMAR, which maintained the dried marijuana restriction, was focused on public health and safety when they were actually endangering it, right? So, dried's more dangerous. It is useful to touch on some of the evidence on this issue presented in this case. 
Dr. Pate provided evidence explaining how the cannabis plant is harvested for its medicinal resin compounds inside the glandular trichomes of the plant. The glandular trichomes containing the therapeutically active chemical compounds can be isolated from the plant matter in different ways, thus eliminating most of the plant matter in the final product, resulting in resin, hash, kit, or pollen, or extracts, oil, or butter. There are multiple ways to ingest the active compounds of cannabis, which have different risks and benefits. Inhalation, rapid onset with short-term relief. Oral ingestion, gradual onset with longer-term relief. Topical, assists skin conditions and joint pain with no psychoactive effects. And transmucosal, rapid onset with short-term relief without smoking. Ingesting the resin can be, even, can be more effective than other forms of administration. As mentioned earlier, Dr. Pate also stated that an individual may consume less cannabis if in edible form, depending on the number of factors, including intended benefit and tolerance. Dr. Baruch stated that in Israel, licensed individuals may purchase marijuana in the form of cannabis buds or oil, and children who require marijuana for medical purposes are provided with cannabis cookies made using dried cannabis. Cannabis oil was introduced for religious reasons. There's little to no difference between the quantities of marijuana a patient must consume through inhalation compared to oral ingestion to obtain the same effect. Dr. Kahn states that there's no scientific evidence that a particular method of consumption is required to treat a particular medical condition. Sure, just put that dried butt on your tumor, Tom! Or that certain forms of Consumption are more efficacious than others. Yeah, oil on the tumor isn't more efficacious than dried bud, Tom. This is Dr. Kalant talking for the government. Dr. Kalant was unable to find a single scientific study comparing the therapeutic effects of undried versus dried cannabis, but he still is going to give us his opinion. According to Dr. Kalant, government prostitute, the restriction to dried marijuana could not be justified. Well, that's, yeah, okay. In like manner, there was insufficient evidence that other forms of consumption are particularly effective. I guess he never thought of oil and tumors, did he? Any such evidence was anecdotal. Yeah, you can't put butt on a tumor! It's anecdotal! However, it was the defendant's burden to justify restrictions to particular forms of consumption. Strains, in much the same vein as the issue of consumption, there is a lack of scientific research relating to medicinal uses of different strains. Thus, much of the evidence relied upon was anecdotal, including the conclusions by the experts. The Ontario Court of Appeal, Nar versus Murnau, stated that the following on anecdotal evidence when commenting on a trial judge's findings not being supported by the evidence. This is where Murnau's lawyer blew it. Love it. Mr. Murnau, both on the application and on this appeal, fundamentally misconceived the nature of the evidentiary foundation required in a case of this kind. He relies on the passage in Hitzig that states the courts, relying on the evidence of individuals' personal medical experiences and anecdotal evidence, have determined that some seriously ill persons derive substantial medical benefit from the use of marijuana. He wrongly takes this to mean that anecdotal evidence of serious illness and the relief of symptoms through marijuana use is sufficient to establish a person's own medical need to use marijuana. This interpretation misunderstands the scope for anecdotal evidence in charter analyses and overreads the passage and hits it. So, the reference to anecdotal, well, let's finish the Murnau bit. The point was that the Court of Appeal threw out the Murnau win because they said, hey, you've proved that the doctors aren't signing, but you didn't ask them why. We don't know if they didn't have a good reason. Dismissed, which is why our challenges we called Myrna plus Y. We asked the um, affiants, the witnesses, why did your doctor say no? Oh, his association wouldn't let him. He didn't want to be a pot doctor. He hadn't done his research. All sorts of non-medical reasons. So that's why Myrna lost, because he didn't ask the right question. 64. The reference to anecdotal evidence in Hitzig. Now, what's neat about anecdotal evidence is that if you get enough of it, you can use statistical inference, then it's not anecdotal no more. So, uh, 
Hitzig recognizes nothing more than that the purposes of judi for the purposes of judicial fact finding, anecdotal evidence has been used to establish the general proposition that marijuana can have some medical benefit for some people. Anecdotal evidence, in a sense, compensates for scientific evidence. Yeah, but as soon as you do a statistical analysis of the anecdotal evidence, you have scientific evidence. But what would a judge know about science, right? And that might otherwise have been used for that purpose. <laughs> In the absence of more and better studies about the therapeutic value of marijuana, anecdotal evidence may be a reasonable substitute. And if you got enough and you're good, you can make it scientific, like I can. Mr. Murnau's lay evidence was sufficient to show that he was not a recreational user and that his Section 7 right to security person was engaged. However, it was not sufficient to show that he fit the medical criteria in the RAR and was therefore entitled to a physician's declaration in support of an application for an exemption. In light of the above comments, and in the absence of more and better studies about the therapeutic value of a strain efficiency, anecdotal evidence is a reasonable substitute in this case. This is because there is a concordance between the anecdotal evidence and objective scientific evidence that different strains have a greater percentage of active ingredient THC. The issue is not without controversy. Dr. Pate, on behalf of the plaintiffs, oh, stated that cannabis has a number of phenotypes, strains, that are created by breeding different varieties of the plant with each other. Different strains produce different effects and levels of efficacy on the patient, depending on the individual and the medical condition. The differing effects and levels of efficacy, efficacy are probably caused by varying amounts, ratios, and synergistic effects of the therapeutically active compound. I accept Dr. Baruch's statement that Israel is recognized as perhaps the leading country in the world in terms of cannabis research. Dr. Baruch has had great success in managing to create strains of cannabis that are significantly potent, 24% THC. The medicine is stable, which means that if the strain is said to have a certain level of CBD or THC, it in fact does. The average supply in Israel affects a high quality product. However, according to the evidence of Catherine Sandvos, legal counsel and deputy manager of the Bureau of Medicinal Cannabis, part of the Netherlands Department of Health Division, it is the understanding of the BMC that patient preference for a particular variety is a matter of taste that is unrelated to efficacy. They'd rather believe taste. There are currently five varieties of dried marijuana with different levels of THC and CBD available for medical use for patients in the Netherlands. Now anyway, the patient, the defendant's witness, Dr. Kellant, agrees that different strains may even have different chemical compositions, but is of the view that there is a lack of scientific research as to whether different strains have different effects for particular patients or illnesses. He remains, duh. Dr. Kellant states that it is not at all clear to a guy with his eyes closed that the large number of so-called strains advertised on the internet are in fact distinct strains, as defined botanically. These advertisements are not accompanied by any evidence that they meet the criteria or that they've been analyzed chemically for their contents of various cannabinoids. The alleged medical efficacy of particular strains is not the result of clinical testing or scientific research, but is instead based on subjective anecdotal reports or promotional advertising by producers. Yeah, um, Amsterdam Kirsch is the best. Get, get my seeds. So, Dr. Kellan states that there's no scientific evidence to support the anecdotal claims that certain strains are useful for certain medical conditions. What kind of university could give a guy like that a doctor's degree? All that is known is that THC and CBD ratios result in different levels of psychoactivity, but that wouldn't have any difference of effect. Oh, 92, Zachary Walsh, the plaintiff's expert on affordability and access, also commented on strains based on the result of the survey, stating, a large proportion of the respondents reported that access to specific strains of cannabis was very important to their symptom relief. Whether or not the empirical work will correspond with the patient's reports remains to be seen. But patients consistently across samples report that a diversity of strains is important. There is basic science showing different cannabinoid levels across different strains. There is a scientific reason to believe that different strains would have different physiological effects 
and there are also entourage effects, referring to the concurrent effects of these diverse cannabinoids that vary across strains. The treatment of survey evidence is discussed later. 93. The evidence is that the use of medical marijuana has both physical and psychological effects on patients. The relief given is influenced in part by the patient's perspective and cannot be callously dismissed as something akin to a placebo. The lack of access to different strains does appear to have an adverse effect on some patients, including some of the plaintiffs in this matter. Marijuana cultivation. Remo Colasanti was the plaintiff's expert witness in cannabis cultivation. He opined on how to produce cannabis indoors in various ways in a res residential area without interfering with neighbors' rights in relation to odor, public safety, fire, electrical safety, and mold, and without risk to the producer and those around them. His evidence is given less weight than might otherwise be, in, uh, be the case because he, like a number of expert witnesses, was so committed to one side of the debate that the objectivity with which this court needed was undermined. Yes, the electrical power outlets were all up to code. Oh, he's too prejudiced. This is science he's talking about, not your social science experts. Okay, and however, his evidence assisted the court in relation to the details of how the cannabis plants cultivated and provided context for some of the concerns asserted by the defendant to justify the MMAR's provisions. It also touched upon the prohibition against growing one's own marijuana. 95. Cannabis needs light, water, and nutrients to survive and grow. If it can grow indoors or outdoors, lighting and physical space are the primary determinants for overall yield and in indoor cannabis production, not the number of plants. Small amounts of cannabis can be produced in small spaces, such as closets, grow tents, growth chambers. There are two primary stages in the plant's life cycle, vegetative growth and flowering. Each stage is characterized by a different amount of light, the sun provides the light needed to grow outdoors and in greenhouses. For our indoor production, different types of lights are used, including fluorescent, lead, and high-intensity lights designed for indoor plant cultivation. Colasanti testified that larger plants are less work and can produce a necessary amount of cannabis. If you can move the pots around, I've had some people say they'd rather grow them in small plants. And he also opined that with the right lighting and physical space, an individual could obtain the same yield from six plants as from 600. And some people would rather deal with 600 mini pots than six monster pots. Okay? But you made our point for both of us. But he also gave evidence regarding the infamous, at least in this litigation, bloom box. The bloom box is an example of a self-contained hydroponic grow box that can be used to safely and inexpensively grow cannabis without odor and does not use excessive amounts of power. It costs $3,300 plus tax. I find the purpose of this evidence was to illustrate that marijuana can be cultivated effectively, safely, and cheaply without massive investment or the measures necessary to address the hazards associated with large growing operations. Dr. Thomas Bowman, the plaintiff's expert witness on horticulture, is a horticulturist and professor of agriculture at the University of Fraser Valley. He provided an expert opinion with respect to general and specific issues or concerns involved in the production or cultivation of plants for food, enjoyment, health purposes, personal use or family use, and limitations thereof. On cultivation, Dr. Bowman states that the technology and equipment that exists today enables a person to grow any plant either outside in soil and greenhouses or indoors safely with respect to themselves and others and without damage to the building or structure in which production takes place. Use of proper electrical connections, water management, environmental control, humidity and temperature, and compliance with all laws and regulations is required no matter the kind of plant being produced. The cost of cultivation is discussed below and affordability and access. Risk of cultivation. The risk of cultivation of marijuana was a major plank in the defendant's case that any interference with Section 7 rights was in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. I mean, these things are so dangerous, these grow ops, that we got to be able to just ban them, as otherwise justified in a free and democratic society. The defendant canvassed the risks of cultivation through expert witnesses. By way of overview, it's necessary for the court to provide some context for its consideration of social science and other non-hard science expert witnesses. 
Many expert witnesses were so imbued with a belief for or against marijuana, almost a religious fervor, that the court had to approach such evidence with a significant degree of caution and skepticism. It's important to recognize the standard necessary for admission of expert opinion evidence, like me when I talk math. Courts must be vigilant to guard against such impermissible evidence. It is trite law that expert witnesses should not give opinion evidence on matters for which they possess no special skill, knowledge, or training, nor on matters that are commonplace, for which no special skill, knowledge, or training is required. In the leading case, R versus Moen, the Supreme Court provided criteria on the admission of expert evidence that advances a novel scientific theory. Imagine, my odds of survival, a novel scientific theory, was advanced to Stephen Godfrey's judge in Nova Scotia, and the some bitch turned it down. So he didn't see how the reduction in the odds of survival could have any bearing on the right to life. In the leading case, yes, I did that. So, since Mohan, they've provided... <clears throat> The expert, okay, although the experts in the present trial did not advance a novel scientific theory and the expert qualifications were not objected to during the course of the trial, it's still necessary to evaluate their probative value. Since Moen, the courts provided guidance on this evaluation. An expert witness should provide independent assistance to the court and should not assume the role of an advocate. An expert should state the facts or assumptions upon which his or her opinion is based and should not omit to consider material facts which weaken his or her opinion, which is why I'm so strong, because I know my opponent's cards and how to play them better than he does. In R versus Abbey, the Ontario Court of Appeal provided the following guidance when assessing the opinion of an expert witness in this context. As with scientifically based opinion evidence, there is no closed list of the factors relevant to the reliability of an opinion like that offered by Dr. Totten. I would suggest, however, that the following are some questions that may be relevant to the reliability inquiry, where an opinion like that offered by Dr. Totten is put forward. To what extent is the field in which the opinion is offered a recognized discipline, profession, or area of specialized training? Operations research, game theory, anyway. To what extent is the work within that field subject to quality assurance measures and appropriate independent review by others in the field? Hey, these are published math books. What are the particular experts' qualifications within that discipline, profession, or area of specialized training? Hey, I'm the only one, and I've already been accepted by the Federal Court of Canada Tax Court. To the extent that the opinion rests on data accumulated through various means, such as interviews, is the data accurately recorded, stored, and available? Well, I don't use data. I use equations. To what extent are the reasoning processes underlying the opinion and the methods used to gather the relevant information clearly explained by the witness and susceptible to critical examination by a jury? Here's a textbook. <laughs> to what extent has the expert arrived at his or her opinion using methodologies accepted by those working in a particular field in which the opinion is advanced? Well, here's the math book. <laughs> And to what extent do the accepted methodologies promote and enhance the reliability of the information gathered and relied upon by the expert? To what extent has the witness in advancing the opinion honored the boundaries and limits of the discipline from which his or her expertise arises? To what extent is the proffered opinion based on data and other information gathered independently of the specific case or more broadly the litigation process? None of it in my case all from the math books. The significance of testing the experts' methodologies against those accepted in the field was highlighted in Kumo Tire Company. The objective of that requirement, the gatekeeper function, is to ensure the reliability and relevancy of expert testimony. It is to make certain that an expert, whether basing testimony upon professional studies or personal experience, employs in the courtroom the same level of intellectual rigor that characterizes the practice of an expert in the relevant field. The Supreme Court most recently applied the Abbey framework and extensively commented on expert opinion and evidence in White, Burgess, Longill, Inman v. Abbott, and Halliburton. So, page 182, Abbey, Ontario Court of Appeal, introduced helpful analytical clarity by dividing the inquiry into two steps. With minor adjustments, I adopt that approach. At the first step, 
the, repro the proponent of the evidence must establish the threshold requirement of admissibility. These are the four Moen factors, relevance, necess necessity, absence of an exclusionary rule, and a properly qualified expert. And in addition, in the case of an opinion based on a novel or contested science, or science used for a novel purpose, the reliability of the underlying science for that purpose. Helps that I'm the best expert in the world. Evidence that does not meet these threshold requirements should be excluded. Note that I would retain necessity as a threshold requirement. At the second discretionary gatekeeping step, the judge balances the potential risks and benefits of admitting the evidence in order to decide whether the potential benefits justify the risks. The required balancing exercise has been described in, very, in various ways. In Mohan, Sapinka J. wrote of the reliability versus effect factor, while in JLJ, Biddy J wrote about relevance, reliability, and necessity being measured against the counterweights of consumption of time, prejudice, and confusion. Doherty J.A. summed it up well in Abby, stating that the trial judge must decide whether expert wit evidence that meets the conditions to admissibility is sufficiently beneficial to the trial process to warrant its admission, despite the potential harm to the trial process that may flow from the admission of the expert evidence. The court went on to discuss the nature of an expert's duty to the court and where it fits into the framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One influential statement on the elements of this duty are found in English K.A.'s National Justice Company, Naviera uh, Lloyds, believed that a misunderstanding of the duties and responsibilities of expert witnesses contributed to the length of the trial. He listed in Obiter Dictum duties and responsibilities of experts, the first two of which have particularly influenced the development of Canadian law. Expert evidence presented to the court should be, and should be seen to be, the independent product of the expert, uninfluenced as to form or content by the exigencies of the litigation. Okay. An expert witness should provide independent assistance to the court by way of objective, unbiased opinion in relation to matters within his or her expertise. An expert witness in the high court should never assume the role of an advocate. Why not? Math, advocate them for the math. These duties were endorsed on appeal. So, underlying the various formulations of the duty are three related concepts, impartiality, independence, and absence of bias. The expert's opinion must be impartial in the sense that it reflects an objective assessment of the questions at hand. Yeah, yeah, but if I make a mistake, people can laugh at me. It's math. It must be independent in the sense that it's a product of the expert's independent judgment, uninfluenced by who has retained him or her or the outcome of the litigation. It must be unbiased in the sense that it does not unfairly favor one party's position over another. Well, yeah, but unfairly, okay. Does not unfairly, and the acid test is whether the expert's opinion would not change regardless of which party retained him or her. And that's a true test of an expert if it didn't matter who hired him. So, these concepts, of course, must be applied to the realities of adversary litigation. Experts are generally retained, instructed, and paid by one of the adversaries. These facts alone do not undermine the expert's independence, impartiality, and freedom from bias. As to admissibility or weight, the following comments were provided. Following what I take to be the dominant view in the Canadian cases, I would hold that an expert's lack of independence and impartiality goes to the admissibility of the evidence in addition to being considered in relation to the weight to be given to the evidence and admitted. That approach seems to me to be more in line with the basic structure of our law relating to expert evidence and with the importance our ju jurisprudence has attached to the gatekeeping role of trial judges. Biddy J summed up the Canadian approach well in JLJ. The admissibility of the expert evidence should be scrutinized at the time it's proffered and not allowed too easy an entry on the basis that all of the frailties can go at the end of the day to weight rather than admissibility. Finding that expert evidence meets the basic threshold does not end the inquiry. Huh. Consistent with the structure of the analysis developed following Mohan, which I've discussed earlier, the judge must still take concerns about the expert's independence and impartiality into account in weighing the evidence at the gatekeeping stage. At this point, relevance, necessity, reliability, and absence of bias can helpfully be seen as part of a sliding scale, where a basic level must first be achieved in order to meet the admissibility threshold and therefore continue to play a role in weighing the overall competing considerations in admitting the evidence. 
At the end of the day, the judge must be satisfied that the potential helpfulness of the evidence is not outweighed by the risk of the dangers materializing that are associated with expert evidence. Finally, I note that opinion evidence is worthless and arguably irrelevant if there is an absence of factual foundation for the opinion. <sighs> Bearing in mind these principles, the evidence of some of the experts on both sides will be given little or no weight. Some had their evidence shredded in cross-examination. This was particularly true of some of the defendants, non-technical experts for the government got shredded. The risks of cannabis production presented during the course of the litigation can appropriately be assessed in four separate categories, mold and other contamination, fire, home invasion, violence and diversion, and community impact. D, mold and other contamination. Dr. Miller was a defendant's expert witness on mold. He's an expert on fungal physiology. He stated that fungal physiology. He stated that marijuana plants release a significantly larger amount of moisture than most house plants. In particular, one marijuana plant adds as much moisture as approximately seven to ten house plants. He outlined that the average residential dwelling in Canada was not constructed to deal with the humidity produced by hundreds of marijuana plants. If cultivation occurred in a multi-unit residential building, in addition to mold damage, the chance of contamination and odor transfer would be common. Dr. Miller stated that mold damage in houses can cause negative health impacts and that plants are only one possible source of moisture, along with showers, cooking, and other common domestic activities. That must be why 90% in houses in Canada have mold. <laughs> Did you know that? Go check it out. 90% of houses in Canada have mold. And they, so they're, anyway, they find it everywhere. Doesn't have to be a grow in there. And actually, if you have a grow in there, you're probably get better at getting rid of mold. So I bet that grow ops probably have less mold than the 90% average rate. How's that for a neat bet and stat? So uh, cooking and showering sort of and adding point source ventilation to remove excessive moisture from growing plants and by an engineered solution is the way to go. Dr. Miller's evidence establishes that mold, while an issue, is one which can be handled without undue difficulty or complexity. Mr. Shutt, a rebuttal witness of the plaintiffs on mold remediation, was adduced as an expert in mold prevention techniques and technologies and remediation of mold infested buildings. He's the manager of EnviroMold, a company that specializes in preventing and controlling mold and remediating premises that have suffered from mold damage. He's inspected and been in charge of cleaning up and remediating over 50 marijuana grow operations in his 10-year career. In his view, there's no difference between growing 20 marijuana plants and 20 tomato plants in an outdoor gar indoor garden. A properly built indoor garden will address the humidity and ventilation issues that exist in a facility, and in particular in the room in which the production occurs. Such improvements upon the condition of a building or residence can be made by fixing any prior existing ventilation problems that might result in mold damage. In many respects, his evidence was consistent with Dr. Miller on the use of ventilation for remediation. <coughs> Several other witnesses all to address mold as an issue. It was acknowledged that different areas in the country, such as lower mainland British Columbia, including Fraser Valley, present greater mold issues than other regions, given the prevalence of natural dampness. Maybe 92%? It is a problem throughout the evidence that the evidence about the lower mainland predominated often to the near exclusion of the rest of the country. However, the NMPR and its justification operates across the country. The evidence establishes that mold issues are often local in nature, but more importantly, irremediable, a matter which is more amenable to local regulation. It hardly justifies the type of regulation at issue. Fire. The defendant relied heavily on both the risk of fire and crime, home invasion or diversion, as its justification for the NMPR. On both these topics, the defendant's experts exhibited a significant degree of bias against marijuana generally. <clears throat> there was a lack of objectivity both in data and analysis. If there was any expertise, it was overshadowed by the lack of credibility of those witnesses. 
The defendant relied on the evidence of the fire chief for Surrey, British Columbia, Mr. Garris, to advance his position regarding fire risk in marijuana cultivation. He testified that inspections of MMAR, residential growing operations in Surrey, revealed widespread problems with respect to improper wiring and electrical panels, unpermitted structural modifications, and the visible presence of mold. His report sent out data compiled from inspections carried out at illicit and MMAR residential growing operations in Sydney, without telling us how many of each. Get that? His evidence was seriously undermined in cross-examination and in the rebuttal expert evidence of the plaintiffs. Moreover, the evidence was not credible and was biased. As explained later, this court cannot put any significant weight on his report. Oh, Mr. Mullen, fire captain and acting battalion chief of the city of Fort McMurray, was a rebuttal witness of the plaintiffs. He's of the view that Chief Garris ignored alternative evidence or explanations for the cause of fires at illegal grow operations. The numbers of fires at all grow sites, which includes illegal sites, has stayed the same or gone down since the number of MMAR licensed growers has increased exponentially. According to Garris's own fire statistics, Mowen was of the view there is no difference between the estimated fire risk of houses that have a licensed grow site and other houses in British Columbia. It's the illegal ones that cause trouble. I see, I notice he mixed the illegal ones with the legal ones without telling us how much. Judge caught him. A theme that ran through some of the evidence of the defendant was that there was little or no difference between the risks from an illegal grow op and that of a properly licensed and code compliant MMAR site. The statistical evidence does not support the conclusion that an illegal covert operation would present the same risk as an open legal one. Mr. Boileau, certified Red Seal journeyman electrician, was also a rebuttal witness of the plaintiffs. His expert opinion is that electrical contractors are able to and do perform electrical installations and indoor marijuana grow facilities under permit for holders of MMAR licenses, and those installations are inspected in compliance with the Safety Standards Act, Chapter 39. The defendant's fire risk evidence was weak and inconsistent. I prefer the evidence of the plaintiffs, especially the electrician. Home invasion, violence, diversion. Corporal Shane Holmquist, a member of RCMP's coordinated marijuana enforcement team, was the key so-called expert witness for the defendant. He provided evidence on mold and contamination, fire, home invasion and violence, and diversion community impacts. On home invasion and violence, what he described as his most qualified expertise, Holmquist stated that residential marijuana growing operations, whether legal or illegal, always lump the two together, right? Are the risk of home invasion and theft because of the monetary value of marijuana. There have been many instances where grow rips have resulted in serious injuries to the occupancy of a residence. Same thing with people who have jewelry. On diversion, he stated that under the MMAR, it was difficult for law enforcement to detect diversion because of the cover provided by the individual's authorization to produce and, protect and possess. So they can't find it, and therefore it must be there, but they just can't find it. Holquist was the most egregious example of the so-called expert discussed earlier in paragraph 101. He was shown in cross-examination to be so philosophical <laughs> philosophically against marijuana in any form or use that his report lacked balance and objectivity. He possessed none of the qualifications of a usual expert witness. His assumptions and analysis were shown to be flawed. His methodologies were not shown to be accepted by those working in the field. The factual basis of his various opinions was uncovered as inaccurate. I can give this evidence little or no weight. It does not establish that there was a sound basis for the new regulatory regime. Community impacts. The defendant relied on Larry Dybvig's evidence, an expert on property values, to provide findings relating to the community impacts of personal cultivation. He is a professional appraiser. Specifically, Dybvig provided evidence on property values, testifying that marijuana growing sites usually require bylaw compliance, 
inspection, and remediation to deal with various problems caused by cultivating marijuana in homes not designed for that purpose. It is noted that his evidence only relates to illicit marijuana grow operations and therefore is irrelevant to this case. <laughs> Don't deal with him, though. No. Ah, he doesn't. Good. Mr. Wilkins, an insurance broker with LMG Insurance, was a rebuttal expert for the plaintiffs. He stated that in the course of his work between 2010 to the present, he's arranged for building insurance for approximately 300 MMAR cannabis growers who grow inside their residences, in outbuildings, and at commercial properties. He provided expert evidence on the issue of insurability of legal MMAR sites, including risks of fire and theft at MMAR grow sites. He stated that the cannabis garden facilities he insures are properly and safely installed according to applicable bylaws and codes. His evidence speaks to the workability of the MMAR in terms of community impacts. He also demonstrates that the MMAR sites did not pose the same problems as the illicit sites discussed by Dibvig. Other witnesses. Eric Nash was both a fact witness and a rebuttal expert witness for the plaintiffs. His fact evidence included his personal cultivation history. In rebuttal, Nash provided opinions with respect to reports tendered by Corporal Holmquist, Chief Garris, John Miller, and Larry Dibdig. Specifically, he commented on the 17 MMAR sites that he has visited and the 400 MMAR growers that he has communicated with. All these sites had professionally installed ventilation and electrical equipment, were clean and well maintained, had been inspected by municipal bylaw officers. None of the sites had issues with mold, fire security, or otherwise. In his opinion, with professional advice and proper ventilation, installation, and monitoring, indoor cannabis production can and does take place safely and securely in residential homes and properties under the MMAR. Based on his experience visiting illegal sites for criminal cases to provide an expert opinion, there is no comparison between illegal and legal growth. That evidence is consistent with other expert evidence accepted by the court. Professor Susan Boyd provided an expert rebuttal report to the opinions given by Holmquist and Garris. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Victoria, where she teaches and conducts research within the Faculty of Human and Social Development. She's the co-author of the book Killer Weed, Marijuana Grow Ops, Mania, and Justice, in which she systematically studies and compares media and justice portrayals of cannabis use and production in Canada. In her report, Professor Boyd comprehensively details what proper research should entail. She stated that Mr. Garris and Corporal Holmquist did not have evidence for their conclusions. Her conclusion is the same as this court's, as seen earlier. The plaintiffs, while the justification for the MMPR system is a vital part of this case, the evidence of the individual plaintiffs is important in comparing the rights infringement caused by the MMPR with its objectives. A. Neil Allard. 132. Mr. Allard, a 60-year-old man, was declared permanently retired in 1999 after working with Veterans Affairs Canada. He's diagnosed with myalgic encephalo encephalomyelitis, a neuroimmune disorder, and clinical depression. He has used cannabis since 1998. It alleviates his pain and assists with his symptoms, such as headaches. In 2004, Mr. Allard received his first ATP, and its limits were based on a dosage level of 5 grams a day. Currently, is prescribed a dosage of 20 grams of cannabis per day. He requires about 600 grams a month. He holds a PUPL and cultivates marijuana in his red area. So he'd have to order four loads every month at priority post cost. At trial, he testified that his current daily use varies between 10 and 20 grams. His methods of consumption largely include vaporizing. However, he also juices and uses edibles in order to meet his medical needs. Particularly, he finds that consuming cannabis juice, non-psychoactive, relieves his nausea, cramping, and other gastrointestinal symptoms, and improves his energy and cognitive abilities. He uses cannabis oil topically to treat skin, back, and body pain and itching. Mr. Allard grows approximately a dozen different strains. His evidence is that the number and type of strains changes over time due to him developing a tolerance. He also states that some of the strains that he's tried are ineffective in relieving symptoms, and some strains make him feel worse. Further, knowing he has a continuous safe supply of cannabis reduces his stress and anxiety level. He derives therapeutic benefit from cultivating, including stress reduction and meditative benefits. Sean Davey and Brian Alexander. First time I heard of Brian Alexander. Mr. Davey is 38 years old. In 2000, he was involved in a serious accident resulting in permanent brain injury that reduced his cognitive abilities. He experiences constant major pain, numbness, and memory imbalance problems. 
He's used cannabis since 2002 and relieves his pain without the side effects of prescription drugs. Together with Mr. Davey and Brian Alexander, oh, together Mr. Davey and Brian Alexander, also an MMAR patient, cultivate cannabis in an outbuilding located on a leased agricultural land reserve. They're both PEPL holders. Since 2013, Mr. Davey's prescription for cannabis has been 25 grams a day. His initial dosage was one or two grams, but that increased each year. He states that his dosage is high in the recommendation of his doctor as he needs large quantities to make cannabis butter for his editors. His evidence underscores that the amount of cannabis used bears a relationship to the method of consumption. Mr. Davey estimates that 90% of his cannabis intake is through edibles, cookies made from cannabis butter, because they relieve pain for longer periods of time and allow him to sleep through the night. He estimates that he uses his vaporizer or smokes approximately every half hour through the day, and it provides rapid onset pain relief. He also uses the cannabis oil for topical applications through body pain and consumes cannabis tea on occasion. His evidence is consistent with that incident. Mr. Davies used a variety of different strains and through trial and error has found that one particular strain is especially effective for him. He did not find that ineffective strains worsen his condition. Davy derives therapeutic benefit from his involvement in the cultivation. His anxiety is reduced knowing what goes into his body. Tanya B. Mish and Dave Hebert, those he left out. Tanya B. Mish is 27 years old. Dave Hebert, her common law spouse is 32. Ms. B. Mish, who intended to appear at trial, was so ill that even alternatives to attendance in court were not feasible. Her evidence on consent was presented by her common law spouse. Ms. B. Mish has type 1 diabetes and a related complication of gastroparesis. Her symptoms include extreme nausea, continuous vomiting, pain, lack of appetite, and sleeplessness. She states cannabis effectively treats her nausea and discomfort, stimulates her appetite, helps with her anxiety and depression, and reduces the unpleasant negative effects of her other medications. Ms. Beamish is no longer able to work, and since November 2013, she spent most of her time hospitalized. She's not permitted to use medical marijuana in the hospital, which aggravates her stomach. The Manson order did not cover Ms. Beamish or Mr. Hebert, as they needed to relocate residences due to financial issues and could not meet the residency requirements of the MMAR. Now, you have to wonder, what does that mean? In November the 13th, she was hospitalized. They needed to relocate, I wonder when. Because if they relocated after November, well then yeah, she's one of the, they are the people who were left out certainly just because they couldn't change their addresses. So, now I don't know what this residency requirements of the MMA are, if that's something else. Prior to the relocation, Mr. Hebert held a DPPL and cultivated cannabis for Ms. Beamish. Ms. Beamish is authorized to use up to 5 grams a day. Her use depends on the severity or symptoms and ranges from 2 to 15 grams. She consumes cannabis primarily by smoking and vaporizing, partly because eating is difficult in her condition. She also drinks cannabis juice. Mr. Hebert occasionally bakes Ms. Beamish brownies with cannabis butter. However, this is rare as solid foods are difficult for Ms. Beamish to consume. Mr. Hebert grew six strains for Ms. Beamish and documented their effectiveness. Her most effective strain is white berry along with blueberry. The other strains were not effective. White berry is a difficult strain to purchase in the black market and is the most expensive. The court accepts each of the plaintiff's evidence as true. They established their need for medical marijuana and the benefits from its use in different forms of consumption and in Manson cut them off over an expired permit and they couldn't move and now they got no medicine. But they established their need for medical marijuana and the benefits from its use in different forms, but they just can't have any. They confirm, if only anecdotally, the benefits of different strains. They also establish the importance of easy access to their own medical marijuana, assurance of its supply, control over their health care, and therapeutic benefit from cultivation. They also establish that many of these benefits under the MMAR are lost to them under the MMPR and the adverse effects they feel from the MMPR. These adverse effects, such as access, include as well matters of affordability and availability. Affordability. The expert evidence. So that's it. Not a word about the fact they were cut off and they're not getting back in. Over a date. But they deserve their medicine. Affordability. 
The expert witness evidence of Professor Grutendorst and Professor Walsh provided context for the application of cost in the access to medical marijuana analysis. The parties had extremely divergent analyses of the cost. In sum, the defendant, the government, considering the medically agreed upon dosages, concluded that affordability was not an issue for the plaintiffs, down at one to three grams a day. The plaintiffs provided a detailed chart illustrating the cost for each plaintiff based on varying dosages and prices, concluding that even at five grams a day, at five dollars per gram, two to three plaintiffs would be significantly adversely impacted. Dr. Zachary Walsh, PhD, R. Psychology, is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at University of British Columbia, Okanagan campus. In his evidence, he references a study he conducted entitled Cannabis Access for Medical Purposes, Patient Characteristics, Patterns of Use, and Barriers to Access, CAMP survey, which involved drafting a detailed survey and collecting results from 628 medical cannabis patients. It was not a clinical trial. He also refers to two articles he co-authored and published. While the study was designed to characterize medical cannabis users and their experience accessing medical cannabis, it's the largest study of medical users in Canada to date. The rationale for the study rested in part on the observation that rates of registration in the MMAR were well below estimates of medical cannabis use. Well, everybody was scared. The researchers felt that this discrepancy reflected factors that warranted further examination and highlighted potential barriers to access. And 90% of the doctors wouldn't sign. Wonder if they noted that one. Overall, those with the worst health had greater levels of barriers related to affordability. No kidding. Financial saving was among the most widely noted motives for self-production. Importantly, Dr. Walsh assessed affordability in the CAMP survey in two categories. The patient's ability to pay for the amount of cannabis that he or she needed to address his or her medical needs. And two, the extent to which people had to choose between their medicine and other necessities alike. During examination, Dr. Walsh stated that affordability is not an absolute ability to afford based on the amount of money one has. It would be the type of choices and lifestyle constraints that would be implied by the cost. Amongst other conclusions, the CAMP survey indicated that the lowest income groups have the most difficulty affording medicine. Oh, how deep. <laughs> a large number of those people choose between obtaining their medicine and other necessities. No kidding if they're short of money. The people with the poorest health have the greatest difficulty affording their medicine and are the most likely to choose between their medicine and other necessities. That's right, people with little money gotta choose. And they did a study to find that out. 152. This would make those with the poorest health the most vulnerable to the unregulated pricing regime under the MMPR. With regards to access and source of cannabis, almost one third of the respondents in the camp survey reported to be self-producing, of whom 50% were licensed to produce for personal use. Among self-producers, the most important reason for self-producing was quality, followed by price, avoiding the black market, and selection of specific strain of cannabis, and safety. It was noted that most medical cannabis users continue to obtain their cannabis from, illicit, from an illicit source. Professor <clears throat> Grutendorst is an associate professor at University of Toronto Faculty of Pharmacy. His research and teaching focus on health economics. He expects